it is also apparent to us that without doubt there is enough might, though not right, behind the military authorities to prevent the court's officers from performing their duties, and to even destroy both the members of the court and its officers. But while the court remains, it must endeavor to perform its duties as it sees it. So I really want to talk to you about this next case, but I'm going to need you to bear with me for just a moment because you need to know a tiny bit of Canada, Alberta case law from a hundred years ago. So this was back in 1918, April 20th, 1918. And what we're going to talk about is the case of Norton. But first I have to tell you about Lewis so that you'll understand what's going on with Norton. Very short though. Henry Lewis was a very simple, well, in concept, what we're talking about here, this part is very simple. Very simple case. The order in council passed by the governor general, let's just say this to say the governor, and approved and everything, it purported to cancel certain exemptions from military service. So there were exemptions from military service, meaning that someone could get out of military service, and the governor general canceled them. So you can't get out of military service. The the court ordered that that cancellation is invalid in as much as it is inconsistent with the primary and substantive provisions of the Military Service Act of 1917 and is not authorized by the War Measures Act of 1914 or otherwise validated. So the point, the whole point that I'm making by showing you Henry Lewis here is that the governor tried to make certain military exemptions invalid so that you couldn't get out of the military and the court said well you didn't do that properly so we have to go uh you have to go back and do that over again so then that brings me to the case of Henry Norton which begins with the refusal of a military officer to obey an order of a judge in the Supreme Court of Alberta which commanded the officer to appear in court with a particular draftee who had filed a writ of habeas corpus and the commander did not appear and the draftee was not discharged and the military and superior officers said that they don't have to obey the court's order. So let's see, how, how do you think, before I go on, what do you think a judge is going to do if a, if a military officer disobeys a court order. What, what is the court going to do? Send in the cavalry? Let's find out. So this is by Chief Justice Harvey. This court is the highest court of this province. It is duly and legally constituted for the purposes of protecting the legal rights of all persons who may come before it. It has all the powers, substantive and incidental, of all of the common law courts of England. These courts grew up and acquired their powers not merely by legislation, but through exercise for centuries. During these centuries, these powers have had to be exercised in times of turmoil and in times of stress, as well as in times of peace and quiet. And more than once in the past, although happily not in recent years, these courts have had to exercise those powers in the face of hostile opposition and even as against hostile force. It would be surprising then if machinery did not exist for such an emergency. Such machinery does exist. The court's officers, in carrying out the decrees of the court, have the legal right and authority to call upon them all able-bodied men within their jurisdiction to assist in the execution of the court's orders, and it is not merely the right, but the duty of everyone so called to furnish such assistance, and what he does in giving such assistance is legal and justifiable, while any opposition to the court's officers and those assisting is illegal and punishable, no matter from whom it comes. This court is now confronted by a situation which is most astounding, arising as it does in this 20th century. Orders have been issued out of the court directed to one Lieutenant Colonel Moore, a military officer, which orders have been disobeyed. 
an order for a writ of attachment against said Lieutenant Colonel Moore has been granted and a writ issued, and the sheriff has been met by armed military resistance in his effort to execute the writ. Counsel for the Military Authorities of Canada has appeared before us and stated that Lieutenant Colonel Moore has disobeyed the orders of the court and is prepared to use force to resist arrest under the direct orders of the highest military officer in Canada, and it appears that these orders have been issued with the approval of the Executive Government of Canada. This seems to me that the military authorities and the Executive Government of Canada have set at defiance the highest court in this province. The circumstances out of which this situation arises, are due to a decision of the court given two weeks ago in Re Lewis, in which it was held by a majority that a certain Canadian order in council was invalid and that the applicant in that case was entitled to be discharged from military custody and control. The court stayed the issuance of the order in that case for two weeks, pending the consideration of whether an appeal would be taken. Since that decision, several other persons, about 20 in all, claiming to be in the same position as Lewis, have applied by habeas corpus proceedings for their discharge. It is the refusal to obey an order directed to said Lieutenant Colonel Moore to produce the applicants so that if so entitled they may be discharged that has caused the writ of attachment to issue against him for his contempt in such refusal. Since the issue of the order, which has been disobeyed, Council for the Military Authorities has produced to us what purports to be an order in council passed by the Governor General on the fifth instance, which, after reciting the judgment in Re Lewis and the orders in council, orders and directs that men whose exemptions were cancelled pursuant to the provisions of the orders in council of the 20th of April 1918, above referred, be dealt with in all respects as provided by said orders in council notwithstanding the judgment and notwithstanding any judgment or any order that may be made by the court, and that instructions be sent accordingly to the general and other officers commanding military districts in Canada. It is apparent that if, as was held in Re Lewis, the governor in council had not authority to cancel the exemptions by order in council, this order in council can have no effect greater than the earlier ones, and that it therefore can be deemed only a notice that the decisions of the courts of Canada are to be ignored and treated with such contempt that military authorities are to be so instructed. Upon this situation, two courses are open to this court. It can either abdicate its authority and functions and advise applicants to it for a redress of their wrongs and the protection of their legal rights, that it is powerless, which of course means there is no power except that of force, which can protect their rights, the consequence of which would scarcely mean anything less than anarchy or it may decide to continue to perform the duties with which it is entrusted for the purpose of guarding the rights of the subjects, and not prove false to the oath of office which each member of it took, when he solemnly and sincerely promised and swore that he would duly and faithfully and to the best of his skill and knowledge exercise the powers and trusts reposed in him as a justice of the said court. There can only be one answer to the question, which way will this court act? It will continue to perform its duties as it sees them. It will endeavor, in so far as it lies in its power, to furnish protection to persons who apply to it to be permitted to exercise their legal rights. It is apparent that the refusal by Lieutenant Colonel Moore and the order against him are only incidents in this application, and that the substance of the application is to obtain the release of the applicants. If the person ordered to produce them will not do so, then unless the court is to confess impotence, it must send someone to obtain and produce them. It is apparent that putting Lieutenant Colonel Moore in jail would be of no service to the applicants unless it served to cause him to do what he was ordered to do, and it is for that purpose primarily 
and not because anything he has done has offended the dignity of the court, that a writ of attachment was issued against him. But if he were in jail under a writ, it would still be necessary to obtain the applicants and have them brought before the court, in order that they might be discharged if so entitled. The evidence before the court shows that they are so entitled if the decision in Henry Lewis be right, and so long as it remains unreversed, it must be deemed to be the proper expression of the law in this province. It is admitted by counsel for the military authorities that he has been informed that some of the applicants have been removed from the province by the military authorities since the applications were launched, in defiance of an order of the court that they should not be removed. This is confirmed by counsel for the applicants. The court can now exercise no jurisdiction in respect of those applicants, though in due time it may possibly be able to punish those persons who disobeyed its orders. It is stated that the decision in Henry Lewis will be reviewed by the Supreme Court of Canada very promptly, and under such circumstances it would be right and proper to allow the applications to stand until after such review. But from what has been said, it is apparent that then it may be too late to protect any of the the applicants who may be removed from its jurisdiction. The order should therefore go directing the sheriff to obtain the persons of the applicants or such of them as may be within the jurisdiction of the court and to bring them before the court and that then they may dis be discharged from military custody and control without further order. They will then be in the province where they can be obtained if it is held that they are subject to military duty. In deciding to pursue its proper functions, this court is not unmindful of the fact, which the Minister of Justice desires to press on us, that the need of Canada for soldiers is very great and urgent. But it is apparent that to allow such a consideration to be our guiding principle would be to substitute expediency for law as the basis of that judicial decision. It is also apparent to us that without doubt there is enough might though not right, behind the military authorities to prevent the court's officers from performing their duties, and to even destroy both the members of the court and its officers. But while the court remains, it must endeavor to perform its duties as it sees it. This court has shown every desire to do nothing that might hinder the military and executive officers so far as could be done consistently with its duty to, to those applying to it for a redress of grievances but has met with little success. After the applications had been ignored and the orders disobeyed, counsel for the Minister of Justice yesterday in the person of Mr. Muir uh, appeared for the first time when the court was about to deal finally with the applications and formally applied for a stay of all proceedings. The court intimated that it would be quite ready to grant the stay if its orders were obeyed and proper provisions made for the protection of the applicants in the event of the decision in Henry Lewis being sustained, and adjourned further consideration until this morning. This morning, no word having been received from the Minister of Justice at Mr. Muir's request, and a further adjournment was made till this afternoon at four. And now, after more than 24 hours, Mr. Muir states that he has just received instructions from the Minister of Justice to refuse to consent to any conditions. Under these circumstances, there seems no other proper course than to make the order as above mentioned. So if you ever wondered what in the world it means to be an officer of the court, or if you ever wondered what a court would do if the military just said, you don't have any power, there you go. The court has very firmly stated, you're right, we don't have the power of force. Do you really want to go back there? So thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Really appreciate you tuning in, being interested in the law and the uh, various ways it plays out. Thank you very much for our Patreon supporters in the month of December. Thank you to Justin Rogers, who has pledged $500 in December, as well as November. We really appreciate that, and we are working on his story. We'll be in touch with that very shortly here. 
Thank you very much to the $50 plus supporters, Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Bernard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Andy, Vera Mantane, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Breakfast Demon, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Jax Merrick, and Daniel Perez. And thank you to the over $205 plus supporters who are scrolling on the LED panel behind me. And thank you to the total of over 400 Patreon supporters that are supporting our channel, making this whole thing possible. How are you? How are you, huh? Huh? And how is Ms. Ilsa? How is Ms. Ilsa, huh? Oh. She stole your ball. She did. She stole your ball. Oh. Hey, hey, hey. Don't jump on her. That's how you're going to hurt her leg. Yeah, you see how she's limping on it already? Eat Nico. Let me see. Is it okay? Hey. You fell on it. Oh well. You're not yiping. He just jumped on her and knocked her over. Hey! Hey, Nico, no. Nico. Yeah, he wants his friend back and he's ready to play. He needs this, she still needs. Well, they, I let them have a ball at home. They don't really. Okay. They don't really, you know, do anything bad with the ball. Put him in his yard and watch him. At home, I guess. Keep him separated. We'll even play ball up in the up in the uh, what? What? How are you? Huh? Huh? How are you? Love you all. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and I will see you this week. Bye.